Welcome everybody to this edition of Attention Talk video. I'm your host, ADHD and Attention Coach Jeff Copper, and we're here today with Dr. Russell Barkley. Dr. Barkley, welcome to the show. Hi, Jeff. Good to be back. You know, Dr. Barkley, over the years I've been doing interviews on Attention Talk Radio and Attention Talk Video, and it was all intended to kind of get out there and have something to talk about in my coaching practice, but the unintended consequence is the amazing education I've got by interviewing experts like yourself. And I've strung together a mental model of ADHD that really, to me, kind of helps explain a lot. And I'd like to kind of just talk my way through it and get your reaction to it. You game? Glad to help. So there's a little bit of Dr. Thomas Brown in this, a little Dr. David Now, a little, a lot of you, uh, Kenneth Bloom, but it works like this. Think of your brain as a low voltage electrical system and the thoughts like a wave of electricity and it travels down a neuron. When it gets to the end of the neuron, neurons don't touch and it signals that the end of that neuron to spray, kind of like hairspray, neural transmitters into the synaptic gap and that helps that electricity move from one neuron to the next. Once the, the neurotransmitters in that gap, it actually gets get sucked back in by the other side. So when we talk about ADHD and neurotransmitters, it's not a chemical thing, it's a mechanism of kind of the spraying and sucking back up. And those with ADHD, as I, as I understand, is there's a, an issue with the mechanism of that spraying and sucking up, which is what so many of the stimulant medications kind of deal with. And one of the main neurotransmitters is, is uh, uh, dopamine. And I did an interview with Dr. Uh, Kenneth Bloom about a, a year or so ago, and I always like to ask questions that nobody has before. And I said, Dr. Bloom, are we addicted to drugs or are we addicted to dopamine? He said, that's a really good question. We're actually addicted to dopamine. The drugs that we're addicted to are the ones that impact dopamine. And I was like, wow, that's kind of interesting. And dopamine is that reward neurotransmitter. It's the booyah, that, that yeah, that kind of drives you forward. And I began to think about your, um, your notion of ADHD as a self-regulation issue. And it kind of came to me as like, okay, if we're a dopamine junkie, it's almost like if you don't get the dopamine, you can't pay attention to it. And if you do get the dopamine, your issue isn't paying attention to it. It's actually stopping, much like an alcoholic. And when, when I think in those, in those terms, I begin to see the correlation because research is coming out between addictive behavior and gambling and all that stuff related to ADHD and it really kind of dovetails into your model of executive um, uh, self-regulation issue because over, well oversimplified the brain is very very complex but in this working model is that that mechanism is off and those with ADHD if they're getting the dopamine they're able to pay attention to it matter of fact their problem is stopping like stopping playing a computer game or something or actually engaging their attention and for me that's been an amazing model because not only are there bad things that you sh that that give you a dopamine rush but there's also other things that are more positive like many people I've coached with AD they have a passion they get the yeah from gaining an insight or solving a problem or trying to figure out a puzzle um, some have a that they get that booyah from, a, from art or something like that and they have a tendency to get into businesses where they're kind of driven forward and, and they, they kind of elicit this stuff. And so as a coach, I, I pay attention kind of each person's own dopamine or motivational blueprint and try to use what they can pay attention to to get around what they don't. So I, I just strung that together. I'm just interested in your comments. I mean, it's, it's not overly, it's, it's a construct that I've put together to kind of help explain kind of why your, your, your self-regulation um, construct makes so much sense. So thoughts? Well, Jeff, I think that's a very good uh, layman's explanation of some of the neural problems that are contributing to ADHD. There, mm -hmm. There's three others that I'm going to comment on, but okay. I think this one hits to the heart of a major problem, and that has to do with the way dopamine is used in the brains of typical people and those with ADHD. Dopamine, as you pointed out, is the reward sensitive uh -huh. chemical, yep. and that's why people pay attention to things, is the things that... Uh, excite them or stimulate the dopamine are the things that we are attending to. Mm -hmm. What it means is that typical people have uh, find that they have more dopamine activated and that it's more yep. effective in helping them pay attention to routine activities. Whereas people with ADHD don't. It doesn't yep. activate for various reasons the way that it should. Uh -huh. And so routine things that might interest you, activate your dopamine yep. if you're a typical person, are not going to be the things that activate their dopamine. They're going to need more yep. more bang for the buck, so to speak, yep. in the activities that they're doing, yep. which is why they're often referred to as sensation-seeking yep. or novelty-seeking yep. or excitement-seeking. Yep 
because they're looking for things that do bring yep. out some of that dopamine surge and then they are able to pay attention to those things. Some of those things are, as you say, constructive yep. and some of those things can be very destructive. Yep. For instance, nicotine yes. or other drugs, cocaine, yep. methamphetamine, yep. even coffee, for yep. instance, are all ways directly or indirectly of trying to boost that dopamine expression in the brain and therefore get that attention going to that activity. Yep. Uh, so you will find them gravitating toward activities that do give them yep. that sort of boost. Now, there are three other mechanisms I just want to quickly yep. mention okay. besides the two you've talked about. You have mentioned that there might be a problem with the creation and expression of the chemical of yep. the dopamine as it leaves the nerve cell. Yep. And then there's a problem with vacuuming that back yep. up into the nerve cell once it's activated. But there's three other problems there okay. that I just want to briefly yep. mention. Please. Another problem they have is that the nerve cell on the other side of that gap, on the other side of that synapse, when the dopamine hits it, it may be deaf, so to speak, to okay. dopamine. It needs more dopamine on it to activate it. And the person might be releasing adequate amounts of dopamine for a typical person, yep. but these nerve cells that are on the other side of the synapse need much more than that in order to activate. Mm -hmm. So there's a problem with dopamine sensitivity yep. okay. in the brain. Another one is that the signal, you mentioned that there's this yep. electrical signal that goes yep. down the nerve cell and then leads to the chemical yep. being pushed out of the cell. Well, that, that sort of pipe, that nerve cell, that fiber, has uh, alongside of it certain little ports that can be opened and closed in order to strengthen or weaken the signal. When the ports are open, yep. they allow more noise in and the signal gets weak. When the ports are closed, the signal is stronger and the nerve cell is able to communicate better. Some of the new ADHD drugs, like the antihypertensive uh -huh. drug guanfacine XR uh, or clonidine XR, these drugs actually fine tune those portholes uh -huh. uh, and they open and close them. Basically, they wind up closing them and guess what that does? It strengthens yep. the signal and therefore at the end of the nerve cell, there's more activation yep. and more dopamine being expressed. So there are various ways to skin that yep. cat. One is by fine tuning the nerve cell. Another that we've noticed is that there may be a, a problem with the fact that the nerve cells didn't go to the right places. We're now learning from genetics and ADHD that the brain difficulties in ADHD are not just dopamine related, they go to very basic mechanisms when the brain is forming uh -huh. as to how nerve cells migrate yep. and find their end point where they're supposed to be and then terminate and prune themselves yep. when they get there to be more effective. And ADHD actually involves problems with this kind of cell migration and termination yep. and pruning. So there's more here than yep. just a dopamine problem. Yep. The networks aren't forming properly. Yep. And when they do form, they're communicating to yep. the wrong places yep. in the brain. Yep. I, I, thank you so much for adding that in there because it really makes kind of a lot of sense. Um, going a little bit further is, uh, in boiling this down as a self-regulation issue, and again, I'm, I've oversimplified the whole dopamine thing, I've learned from Dr. Rady that you know exercise is kind of like the wonder drug, and when a person exercises, it has an impact on those neurotransmitters as well. Is, is, is that correct? Absolutely. Even though it's a, it's a budding literature at the moment, uh, and we need to have more rigorous research than what's been done so far. What research has been done, uh, for instance, it was reviewed by Dr. Betsy Hosa at Vermont in the last issue of my newsletter. What she concludes is that there is great promise here. There's an awful lot of suggestive evidence coming out of different research labs uh, that exercise is an effective means of helping yep. people cope with and compensate yep. for their ADHD. It's not a cure. Yep. It doesn't get rid of yep. it. If you exercise for a couple of weeks, it's not yep. going well. well, a way that is. But what you can do is to build a routine exercise yep. into your day whenever you yep. know that there are moments coming yep. up where you need to concentrate yep. better. You would be better off doing some very brief aerobic activity yep. than you would be simply going back over yep. your notes or you know getting a coffee or yep. something like that. So Dr. Reedy is absolutely right. Right. Uh, exercise yeah. does appear to be one of the newly discovered yeah. mechanisms for helping to cope yeah. with your ADHD better. So another question I have leading into that, it's, it's, it's the same answer, it's a different way of kind of going about it, is deadlines. Um, those with ADHD is, you know, I got to wait to the deadline, but, but I'm wondering if that's kind of self-medicating too, because you get that adrenaline rush. Does that impact the, the neurotransmitters? And that's why upon a deadline, those with ADHD kind of maybe pay attention to things they wouldn't ordinarily because that, that, that those neurotransmitters are being messed with because of that fight or flight feeling. Uh, I, I think so. Uh, people need to understand in order to appreciate what you're describing here better is that we all have a, a time horizon. Mm -hmm. How far ahead 
do we begin to think about, activate to, plan for, uh, and get ready for the future coming at us? And people with ADHD have a very narrow time horizon. And so as a result of that, those people are going to allow things to come nearer in time to enter their narrow window on time, and then they activate to it. We don't activate until events come into our window. Yep. They pass our time yep. horizon, not someone else's. And if your time horizon is very near, you're not going to activate to the event until it's very near. But as you've pointed out, once that event comes into your time horizon and your window, you will start to activate. And you do get that dopamine activation, among yep. other things that happen, and then you start to deal yep. with it. So although part of the reason they procrastinate is that they have this narrow window on time, they're not looking ahead into the future, yep. they're nearsighted or blind yep. to that future, part of it is when things get near in time, as with all of us, we activate. Yep. And that activation includes this kind of dopamine yep. activation. And then you're able to concentrate and get it done. Yep. Unfortunately, as you know, often it's too late. Yep. There's not enough time yep. to do what you should have gotten yep. done earlier. And now you have another crisis yep. on your hands. Well, you know, I have to... I really have to credit you because when I first started listening to your construct on the executive deficit disorder or really self-regulation, that was kind of sparked me to kind of string all these other things together because I can tell you I'm much more of a coach because I do look at people as a self-regulation issue and I say, hmm, if I can understand their dopamine blueprint because there are more difficult things, but I, there are those passionate things that they can do, as I begin to work with that self-regulation to help use what they can pay attention to to get around what they can't by helping them kind of manage their environment. You use the word scaffolding and those types of things, but it's it's really kind of designing that place that's optimal for you to step into so you can kind of be yourself in that particular situation and not fight it. But, but one of the keys, too, is the notion of that's happening and the person becoming aware of it. This is where the mindfulness exercises and aware of oneself because you can begin to catch yourself and begin to override some of these things, and now you're working with your ADHD as opposed to against it. Precisely. Uh, I think that's a very good way of describing it. it. That is that people with ADHD are going to need that external yep. structure, that scaffolding, yep. those reminders, those lists, those yep. notes, that way of arranging the environment. They're going to need yep. that done differently than other people do. But if it's done, it can reduce the impairment yep. from the disorder. It doesn't get rid of yep. the disorder, but it can help to very effectively compensate for those yep. difficulties so that the person can be as effective as other people, yep. as productive as other people, even though they yep. may have to rely on yep. this external organization and these external structures more than others. Well, Dr. Barker, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on the show and actually doing this interview with me because I kind of sprung this one on you over a period of time. I was anxious to kind of get your reaction. So, um, and, and I do think it's a, it's a good, simple working model to help explain so much of what's going on. So again, Dr. Barkley, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Jeff. My pleasure. Take care.